Hi and welcome to this Act of Worship. Hopefully you've got a paper copy of this worship at home. If you haven't, you can download it from the website. This way we're all going to share in some worship together, even though we're separated at the moment in our different homes. So we're following the sheet that you've got and we're just going to start with some silence at home. You might like to light a candle or just be quiet. So we come to our opening prayer. Let us pray. Lord God Most High, I am giving you worship with all my life. I am giving you obedience with all my power. I am giving you praise with all my strength. I am giving you honour with all my speech. I am giving you love with all my heart. I am giving you affection with all my sense. I am giving you my being with all my mind. I am giving you my soul. O most high and holy God. Praise to the Father. Praise to the Son. Praise to the Spirit the three in one. And we continue in prayer with our prayer of thanksgiving and confession. Lord, you are steadfast in your love and infinite in your mercy. I praise you for what you've done in my life. In the quietness, bring to mind those good things to thank God for. Thank you for the gift of Jesus, who shows us what you are really like. You welcome sinners and invite them to be your guests. Forgive me when I felt myself to be better than other people. I confess my sins, trusting in you to forgive me. In the quiet, I share with God the things I need forgiveness for. Thank you that you are a merciful God in whom I may know forgiveness, freedom and new life. Amen. Psalm 121 I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and, and your coming in.
from this time on and forevermore. So it's Ezekiel chapter 37, the first uh, 14 verses. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all round them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded and as I prophesied suddenly there was a noise, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked and there were sinews on them and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them. But there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slains, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost, and we are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. So we come today to our Gospel reading. Over these next weeks, there will be different Gospel readings, different stories of Jesus. Some of them are quite long passages. You might choose to focus on part of them. John 11 verses 1 to 45 Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. 
her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you. And are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, 
Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus looked upwards and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. In the middle of the remarkable story of the raising of Lazarus, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and I am life. Let's start not with life but death and Ezekiel's strange vision of the valley of dry bones. Ezekiel sees in his mind's eye both the physical effects of death and the spiritual and moral equivalent when people and nations lose their sense of humanity, justice, dignity and hope. Such deaths are all too present in today's world, where one out of every two people suffers from malnutrition. Millions live under tyranny, tens of thousands suffer torture, and where weapons of mass destruction, nuclear, chemical and biological, abound. And right now, of course, we all live under the dark cloud of the coronavirus, separated from one another with the daily spiralling reality of the pain of loss for all too many families. I got some insight into this valley of dry bones and death when I read of an even worse situation, described in Primo Levi's book, Hope and Despair in Auschwitz. He writes about the onset of winter. We know what it means because we, are, we were here last winter. From October to April, seven out of ten of us will die. Whoever does not die will suffer minute by minute, all day, every day. We will have to keep our muscles continually tensed, dance from foot to foot, beat our arms under our shoulders against the cold. We will have to spend bread to acquire gloves and lose hours of sleep to repair them when they become unstitched. Wounds will be open on everyone's hands and to be given a bandage means waiting every evening for hours on one's feet in snow and wind. That's one kind of living death. There was another kind as well, the death of humanity including the moral and spiritual death of those who caused or allowed such things to happen and had lost all concern for other human beings. The huge biblical question is, can such dry bones be brought back to life? Ezekiel is clear that the breath, the Spirit of God, can bring resurrection that is, new life. 
The story of the raising of Lazarus equally graphically affirms that life can emerge out of apparent death. John's Gospel uses stories rather as a film director or dramatist might. The author of John takes one story from the many that have been told about Jesus and retells it. His concern isn't to describe precisely what happened or to record exactly what the characters in the story had said some 50 or 60 years earlier. No, he orders the action and the dialogue of his story so that his readers cannot miss the central truth that in the company of Christ, when darkness and death seem overwhelming, new life is really possible. The story is long and the dialogue complex. John seems to make Jesus rather unfeeling when he delays going to Bethany, but that delay is necessary if the story is to end in the way it does. John makes up for it by describing the consequences and the pain of Jesus, or the compassion and the pain of Jesus, when he eventually meets Martha and Mary and weeps with them. There are different levels of understanding in the conversations. To Martha, Jesus says, you know he will rise again, don't you? And Martha gives the faithful answer, yes, I know that he will rise again at the resurrection on the last day. Hers is the hope that many of us share, trusting that after death we will be whole and complete with God in eternity. But Jesus is using the idea of rising again in a new way. I am the resurrection and I am life, he says. And as the dramatic ending of the story will show, resurrection can begin right now. At the climax, Jesus enters the tomb. He calls out in a great cry, Lazarus, come forth! And what we're being told here is the fact that resurrection begins when we hear Christ's call and respond in trust and faith. At the end of the Second World War, when much of the world lay in ruins, there were those who heard the call of Christ and founded Christian Aid, with a vision of a world rising from the death of war. Today Christian Aid has a wonderful and important slogan, We believe in life before death. It's a way of saying that God wants all his children to know the full meaning of life. God's will is to save people from failure, misfortune and guilt from tyranny and selfishness. God's will is for individuals and whole peoples to know the meaning of peace <coughs> and love, especially as we go through the dark clouds of danger and difficulty. The New Testament is full of examples of this resurrection life. Zacchaeus gives back what he has stolen. Simon Peter is set free from the guilt of his denial. The fearful disciples change out of all recognition on the day of Pentecost. St Paul, in his letter to the Roman church, speaks of his resurrection life, or this resurrection life. The God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give you new life through his indwelling spirit. The current crisis brings the darkness of illness and possible loss, and with it, sadly, some responses of selfishness and greed. But it also brings signs and signals of life-giving reassurance and the warmth of human love and support from family and friends through their telephone calls, emails and letters, and through messages from church leaders and the minister of our own church. Signals of new life have dropped through my door in the form of letters of support from good neighbours groups in Skipton and in Empty. And the depressing gloom is pushed back by the will willingness of medical personnel to put their own lives on the line. 
and the good humour of supermarket staff as they serve in difficult circumstances. But we also have the resources of our faith. The words of Jesus remind us of the dangers of anxiety, the importance of compassion, the life-giving effects of forgiveness and being forgiven, and the absolute importance of love for our neighbours. New resurrection life is nourished in us as we reflect on the promised fruits of the Spirit, including patience, kindness, generosity, gentleness and love. The development of such fruits requires an effort of will, but they're also gifts that can make us whole and keep us mentally and spiritually balanced, and which, like a rainbow through the rain, point forward in hope. Yes, there is much darkness in the world, and Ezekiel's valley of death is all too contemporary. Yet when people of faith, people with a vision of peace and reconciliation, people with a grasp of justice, people who trust in the kind of love that was lived out by Jesus and given its greatest expression on the cross, when such people bear their witness to him and in love band together, when they speak with one voice and share in united action, great things can happen. New life is possible. Christ, who is the resurrection and the life, calls us to come out of the tomb and to live. Let us pray. Creator God, your world lies ill, wounded by warfare, sickened by injustice, poisoned by pollution, dying for lack of food. Creator God, we pray for new life for the world. Saviour God, humankind lies ill, wounded by sorrow, sickened by fear, poisoned by illness, dying from lack of love. We pray especially at this time for all those who are ill as the result of the coronavirus and for all who seek to tend and care for them, remembering especially doctors and nurses and their support staffs. Saviour God, we pray for new life for humanity. Come, Spirit of God, breathe life into our tired minds, strength to weakened limbs and sight to clouded eyes, warmth into hearts that are cold and loveless. Come, Spirit of God, bring power into ineffective lives. Turn apathy to passion for your cause. Renew, refresh, illuminate our souls. And help us to live to glorify your name. Through Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. God of all hope, I call on you today. I pray for those who are living in fear, fear of illness, fear for loved ones, fear of others' reactions to them. May your spirit give us all a sense of calmness and peace. I pray for my church family in this time of uncertainty, for those people who are isolated especially those living alone, for those offering support to others, for courage to find ways of showing God's love and grace in the midst of uncertain and changing times. 
Grant us your wisdom. Grant your peace. I pray for the suffering and sorrowful and for all who need my prayers. I especially want to pray for Holy God, I remember that you have promised that nothing will separate us from your love, demonstrated to us in Jesus Christ. Help us turn our eyes, hearts and minds to you. Eternal God, through your Son you have filled each person's life with your presence. Help us in our sufferings and trials and strengthen us in our weakness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So we come to our closing responses. May the mind of God be in us. May the Spirit of God give us life. May the power of God uphold us. May the love of God prompt our thinking. May the peace of God bless our actions. May the presence of God be with us now and always. Amen. May God be with each one of us at this time of challenge and uncertainty. And may you know his presence in your hearts your lives and your homes. Amen.